Hi everyone, I'm uh, Bill Arney. I'm the director here at the Contemporary Arts Museum. I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Um, this is going to be really, really fun. When I, I moved to Houston about a little over six years ago, and I started getting, um, I, nobody had told me that you actually had to study Texas art history as like a separate class, that we didn't get in uh, the Northeast. And I started reading the books that were out and meeting some of the legendary figures and hearing stories. And I was thinking like, yeah, there, there's something really amazing to be written about this group of renegades that started, um, that started contemporary art here. And it goes back a ways. And I got to hear a few talks. And then I uh, started, I saw uh, Pete Gershwin's first book. And then I also, so, uh, we went to lunch and we started talking about how he started these researchers. And I found out he started writing originally about music. And I was like, oh, well, that makes sense because the great founders of the uh, art scene here are really more like rock stars than they are like traditional Northeast academic visual artists. So this is going to be a very uh, fascinating talk for me. I'm prepared to take notes, and I want to welcome Pete Gertrude. Thanks, all y'all, for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, as you have gathered, I am writing this book right now about contemporary artists working in Houston between 1972 and uh, 1985. And uh, I guess I, I should start by giving you sort of the quick elevator speech that I've been telling everybody about what this book is about, uh, which uh, is that this is a, a book about artists working together in Houston, largely outside of the established gallery and museum system uh, which uh, at the time in Houston was not necessarily very supportive of Texas artists, uh, and so they uh, had to find other ways of making things happen. And this place right here, the Contemporary Arts Museum, even though uh, it is a museum by name, uh, in many ways it was an, an alternative art space in the, in the 70s, uh, under the directorships of uh, Sebastian Lefty Adler and uh, Jim Harithis, who was really the first guy to truly champion Texas artists. He went out, he found these people who most of them had not really shown before in a museum or anywhere, uh, and, uh, and he brought them here to show their work and build a scene. And this is followed by uh, the uh, work that happened at the Lawndale Annex at the University, University of Houston uh, under the directorship of uh, Mr. James Searles, who is here with us tonight, and I'm very happy to see him. And uh, then uh, also uh, it, it kind of set the stage for the rise of, of uh, many alternative art spaces downtown, including uh, some that we still have and some that we don't have, diverse works, uh, Midtown Art Center, Michael Peranto Center for Art and Performance, uh, also uh, various uh, organizations in town such as the Women's Caucus for Art, uh, the Urban Animals, the uh, core program at the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, and uh, this activity uh, I see all uh, building up uh, and culminating in an uh, exhibition that happened at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston uh, in uh, February of 1985 called Fresh Paint. Uh, which was uh, really the first time that the uh, museum across the street uh, took on local artists and presented it in a, a serious way. Uh, and this was curated by uh, uh, the curator at the time, Barbara Rose and Susie Khalil. And uh, I feel like this really uh, kind of capped off a, an era of activity here in Houston uh, that uh, uh, really set the stage for the, uh, the art scene that we enjoy here today. So. Uh, that's what I'm writing about. I'm basing this on uh, work that I've done in various archives around town, uh, looking at the, the uh, original records uh, and then supplementing this with uh, many interviews. I've conducted more than 50 interviews at this point, uh, including interviews with uh, many people in this room, actually. Uh, and uh, so I have to thank for sure uh, Lorraine Stewart, who is the archivist over at the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, which also holds the uh, CAMS records, who uh, has uh, uh, given me really unfettered access to the archives over there to do research. Also, University of Houston Special Collections. Uh, I've been over there many times. Many artists have shared their own personal archives with me. And I have to thank the, you know, the many artists who have spent hours and hours and hours uh, letting me uh, come to their houses and offices and ask them just question after question. And I have to thank Bill and the CAM for having me tonight. 
this is really exciting. I'm really happy to be doing this. This is the first time I've read any of this material. Two or three people have read some of the text, uh, but this is the first time that I'm am presenting any of it pub publicly, so I hope you will be kind and that this will be interesting for you. I'm going to do my best. Um, so uh, let me just go ahead and get started. I'm going to read to you from the very uh, beginning of the book. It's the first chapter, and it's called uh, A Culture on a Corner. Uh, can you believe this? The, immaculate, the immaculately coiffed socialite asked her husband as they peered at a family of huddled mice in a wire cage. This isn't what I expected to see, but then I didn't know what to expect. It was the evening of March 12, 1972, and the couple was examining a wall of tiered enclosures containing kittens, rats, mice, pigeons, doves, and cockroaches. The location wasn't a zoo or a pet shop. It was the gala unveiling of Houston's new Contemporary Arts Museum, the culmination of a $300,000 capital campaign funded by the city's bluest blue bloods, members of families who had made their fortunes extracting oil from the East Texas Basin and who might be very much at home with a quality mid-century abstract expressionist painting by Robert Motherwell or Franz Klein hung over the, the sofa. But when wealthy patrons and prominent art figures from around the country ascended a concrete ramp, and squeezed through a narrow aperture in the windowless steel skin of the parallelogram-shaped building, they were unprepared for what they found inside. A groundbreaking exhibition curated by the museum's brash, chain-smoking young director, Sebastian Lefty Adler. With it, he promised to test every limit of contemporary art, not to mention the very limits of his patrons' patience. The odiferous urban wildlife of artist Ellen Van Fleet's New York City animal levels was one thing. Newton Harrison's portable farm was another. The California-based conceptual artist filled the gallery with live plants under grow lights. Strawberries, peas, beans, potatoes, carrots, lettuce, tomatoes, and onions, as well as a worm farm housed in a wooden, soil-filled planter box. It's certainly different, isn't it, laughed Gene Kessler, one of the board members who'd worked to raise the money for the new building. I think it'll be in for a lot of criticism because it's new, but when the Whitney and the Guggenheim opened in New York, everyone made fun of them, too. Perhaps she was already hearing the snickers and muttered asides as Houston's social elite examined the plants, the animals, the 48-foot attenuated metal pipe hung at eye level by New York sculptor Robert Grovener and the small black and white TV, which displayed a short film by a young artist from California named William Wegman, starring his beloved Weimaraner pup, Man Ray, who sat turning her head from side to side. When a patron attempted to climb onto a bicycle that was part of an installation piece by sculptor John Elberty and was asked, to stop, uh, asked by a guard to stop, he snapped, if that's a piece of art, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm very disappointed when a prominent Houstonian scoffed to a reporter from the Houston Post demanding that he not be identified by name in the article. This is a miserable showing for what should have been a very important evening. It's not the sort of thing the city needs in a contemporary arts museum. I wonder what's going to happen when they try to get donations from some of the established donor types in Houston. Another guest dismissed the show as well and grumbled that he could have been home watching a John Wayne movie for all the good I got out of it. <laughs> One could practically hear the sound of pledge forms being torn to pieces. Back over at Van Fleet's New York City Animal Levels, a museum employee made some quick repairs after a cat and several rats escaped from the chicken wire enclosures and into the crowd, causing no small amount of consternation. I've never seen anything like this, said Marilyn Miles, as her husband, Stephen, lit her Tijuana small. It's certainly interesting, but you have to sit back and think about what this all means in terms of art. A light display programmed by Canadian multimedia artist Michael Snow flashed on the exterior screens of the Goodyear blimp high overhead as 642 guests adjourned to debate the merits of the exhibition at 25 dinner parties scattered throughout the city. And many went on to a late night party at the Milieu, Houston's hippest disco. Was the evening worth its $125 ticket price? One guest told the Post, it was a lot of money to pay, but it certainly has got a lot of Houstonians talking about art in this city. And whether you like this kind of art or not, it's good that at least people are thinking about it. The unveiling of the long-awaited new building, designed by Latvian-born and German-educated architect Gunnar Burkertz, working in collaboration with Houston construction firm Charles Tapley Associates, was a product of a capital campaign that consumed much of Adler's attention during his tenure in Houston. It is not an Acropolis we want here, Adler had insisted at the time. It is not culture on a corner. I think of the new museum building as a stage environment to house the multimedia in which artists of today are working. Not everyone was completely sold on this new building. 
The members of the Ant Farm, a San Francisco-based collective of multimedia art guerrillas, roamed the opening and cornered Philippe de Montebello, the conservative young director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, whose campus, just catty corner to the CAM, was completing a major facelift with the addition of a new street-phasing plaza of glass and black steel designed by modern architect Mies van der Rohe. I find it uh, interesting, de Montebello said, squirming and clearly struggling to find something kind to say about the eyesore across the street from his sleek new addition. I haven't yet uh, understood it fully because it's a rather odd and different kind of space. The two institutions made for uneasy neighbors, and their directors were the embodiment of their conflicting attitudes. In contrast to his colleague's haberdashing fencing master's good looks, wrote one reporter, Adler's wanted appearance suggests that he spends his nights slung over the back of a chair. <laughs> Nevertheless, behind a perpetually overflowing ashtray, Lefty's smirk and his sparkling blue eyes indicated that he knew exactly what he wanted, and he routinely pulled out all the stops to go after it. Inevitably, the first exhibition in a new building such as this would make a bold statement about the institution's intentions going forward. Adler had spent over a year traveling the country and had chosen 10 cutting-edge artists. Each received an invitation to devise and install work that would represent the most forward-thinking trends in the field of contemporary art. All but one had traveled to Houston to examine the new museum building, still under construction, and make site-specific decisions about content, scale, construction, and placement. Teams of art students from Rice University, the University of Houston, and the University of St. Thomas were drafted to provide countless hours of labor during a whirlwind week of installation. But on opening night and during the weeks that followed, not everything went as planned. Vera Simon's wave transplant aimed to replicate the natural cycles of an ocean wave in a narrow outdoor trench, but the machinery failed to work properly and it barely produced a ripple. Harrison's portable farm was the indoor greenhouse intended as both a modern art installation and a teaching tool that would produce salad feasts for museum visitors throughout the show's run, but blight attacked its potato patch and soon marijuana plants began to grow from the many seeds pushed into the soil by visitors. <laughs> Van Fleet's rats and cockroaches continued to escape from their cages, and some took refuge in the desks of the museum's administrative staff. Far worse, surrounded by disease-carrying animals, many of the cats fell ill and died, and soon those that remained were re removed from the display. As the exhibit wore on in the spring, the mice began attacking each other, and the smell of their feces combined with that of the rotting vegetation of Harrison's portable farm became unbearable. In an article for the Texas Monthly, writer Charlotte Moser wrote that the new cam had laid what looked like a $48,000 egg. Many of the 7,550 visitors who saw the exhibit during its first five days reacted with confusion, shock, and anger, including the Houston Post's Eleanor Freed, one of Houston's most trusted art critics. The first impression of the visitor is one of clutter and fragmentation, wrote Freed, and once over the threshold, he best tread gingerly, for he is instantly confronted and blocked by a redwood obstacle course surrounded by gravel. The vast horizontal panorama and soaring feeling of freedom provided by the architect have been canceled by the disrupting installation of such a divergent collection. Cruelest of all was Lynn Ashby's column in the Post, entitled Hang Ten. Obviously intended as a breezy, lighthearted roast of the troubled exhibition, the language perhaps gave voice to the typical reaction to the show by ordinary Houstonians. Here it sits, fellow patrons of the arts, the Contemporary Arts Museum, a bright and shiny warehouse of objet d'art looking like a chic injector blade for the Jolly Green Giant. But it is obvious that the new museum is not complete. Here's a pipe about 50 feet long, four inches in diameter running across the room, apparently put there by a sloppy plumber too lazy to mount it correctly. Gad rung again, it's airy point by Robert Grovener. I'll be damned, it still looks like the work of a lazy plumber. But at the building's dedication, Adler had insisted that this museum is not dedicated to the ridiculous or the sublime or the kooky or the groovy. These are the ideas of our time, the reflections of our time. Often you will go in and be intrigued and wonder, is this art? I don't think you can ever answer that. It's like asking, is this religion? Still, it was all too much for the board, which had to deal with the angry phone calls from confused and agitated donors. Everyone was so completely turned off by the show, says Marilyn Oshman, then known as Marilyn Lubetkin, who as the junior member of the CAMS board had been designated special projects coordinator and was tasked as the liaison between the museum and the 10 artists. The daughter of Houston sporting goods entrepreneur Jake Oshman, Marilyn had moved away to New York City in 1960, 
where she took art history classes with the trend-setting gallerist Ivan Karp, attended groundbreaking early shows by Andy Warhol and Jasper Johns at the Leo Castelli Gallery, and witnessed some of the legendary avant-garde happenings staged by Alan Caprao. When she returned home five years later to start a family of her own, she took some classes at the museum's art school with Richard Stout, one of the city's leading non-objective painters, but still she found herself creatively adrift. I had a different vision about art than what was here, she says. It took me a while to find my spot until someone told me I should go over to see what was happening at the Contemporary Arts Museum. She worked there first as a volunteer, greeting visitors, answering phones, and shuffling papers early on in the Adler regime. It was nothing really, but I was finding my way, she says, and I was happier there than I was making paintings at the MFA. In time, she began to show talent for fundraising as well as a collector's eye for art, and Adler recommended her for the board in 1970. Uh, one day, as she stood looking at the barely perceptible ripples of Simon's failed wave on the corner of Montrose and Bissonnette, she was approached by a man named Alvin Romansky, one of the charter members of the Contemporary Arts Association from which the CAM had evolved, and a lifetime trustee of Houston's August Museum of Fine Arts. He was also a close friend of Lubeckin's parents, but when she went to give him a hug, he shoved her away. Why would you be involved in anything like this, he demanded angrily, pointing across the street at the shiny silver pa parallelogram. Your father would turn over in his, in his grave if he knew you were doing this. With that, he spat on the sidewalk in front of her and stormed off. <laughs> she never saw him again. I was so young, I didn't know how to respond, she says. In fact, I'm not even sure I knew what I thought of it all. Board members were embarrassed by the bad publicity, and though Adler announced his resignation in December 1972, the fact is he was fired. His chief curator, Jay Beloli, and several other staff members resigned in support, forcing a wholesale reinvention of the organization. What was meant to be a magnificent new chapter in the institution's history had deteriorated into its greatest crisis in less than 10 months' time. The museum found itself in a familiar position of peril, lacking a director mired in debt in the laughingstock of Houston's cultural community. Would the CAM even stay open? Nobody wanted to represent the museum at that point, insists Lubetkin. Houston patricians on the board like attorney Ford Hubbard and developer F. Carrington Weems couldn't afford to be associated with the blinking blimp and fleeing cockroaches masquerading as contemporary art. So they begged me, I mean begged me to be the board president. I was 32, I didn't even know how to run a board meeting, but they said, we can't do it, you have to do this. Lubetkin accepted, and clearly the first order of business was to look for a new director, but who could bring the struggling institution back on track? Adler had some forward-thinking ideas, yes, but the man Lubetkin would find to replace him would pr prove to be even more of a maverick. For four turbulent years, he would make the contemporary art of Texas central to his programming at the CAM, and in doing so, he would change the face of art in Houston. Uh, the person I'm talking about is, as you have probably gathered, the next director of the CAM, Jim Herathis, who, as I was saying before, really did change the face of art in Houston. I don't think anybody can argue that. And in a uh, very uh, quick succession, uh, he uh, came in and completely uh, indexed the uh, artists of the state, uh, driving around, finding them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that now. Uh, Ma when Marilyn found him, he was coming off of terms uh, directing the uh, Corcoran in Washington and the Everson Museum in Syracuse, uh, where probably his best known show was uh, Yoko Ono's first museum show. Uh, but pr uh, probably, if you ask Jim, the thing that he would say he was most proud of was the programming that he was doing in the Auburn State uh, Prison, where he was bringing people like Norman Bloom uh, actually in to uh, do workshops uh, with the inmates, and then he actually hired a lot of these uh, inmates when they got out of prison and uh, they came to uh, work at the Everson Museum. Uh, so, uh, Marilyn uh, met him at a, um, a conference and uh, was uh, interested in his speech, offered him the job. Uh, he knew a little bit about Houston because his mother and, and his sister were working here and he had uh, recently done a, a show of the work of uh, Dorothy Hood, who was one of uh, Houston's most important artists at the time. So, uh, he was familiar with the place and what he told me was that he, even more interesting to him was that he thought that Houston could be a gateway for him to Mexico and Central America, which were places that he was interested in, in uh, exploring. So uh, after accepting the job in February, Herathus invited Lubetkin to visit the Everson in early April where he was hosting a groundbreaking conference entitled Video in the Art Museum. Uh, having already worked with the Ant Farm and other emerging video artists, Lubetkin was enraptured and she felt certain that the board had made the right decision. My God, she thought, this man could bring something so exciting to Houston. 
During the visit, Harith has told Lubetkin he noticed that she didn't have any artists from Houston represented in her collection. She responded that she didn't know any good ones. Now, Marilyn, you know there are good ones there, Harith has told her, and we're going to find them. Uh, arriving in Houston in late June, Harith has hit the ground running with a clear priority to engage the city and explore the statewide art community. He inherited a ragtag gallery staff consisting of aspiring painters and musicians. For two bucks an hour, they installed and watched over the artwork, tended the front desk, cleaned the bathrooms, and did other odd jobs around the museum, uh, not to mention smoking grass and rehearsing their band in the lower gallery after closing time. While the new director started to organize the programming for the fall season, he invited the staff to hang their own work on the museum's blank walls. You guys are artists, right? And he asked them, well, let's do a fucking show. <laughs> Art of the Lower Crust featured work by Mike Hollis and Herschel Berry of Dawkins Corotta, Berry's wife, Molly Farr, and Andy Fian, a young artist who was studying under the mentorship of Earl Staley at the University of St. Thomas. It was Herethus's way of acknowledge, acknowledging all of us as artists and saying thank you for keeping the museum going for many months while it had no director, said Fian. Mike Hollis named the show, uh, mockingly referring to us guards and prep staff as the low ones on the totem pole. Even the secretaries downstairs acted like they were our bosses. The staff and board had done their best with a, without a director, but no doubt about it, things were a mess. When I came down and looked at the books, I thought, my God, this is the worst, said, says Herethus. The museum had no money, they hadn't paid their debts, they were just in terrible shape. We were gonna have to start from scratch, but something about that appealed to me. <laughs> Texas is great from my own perspective, Herethus wrote shortly after his arrival in a letter to his friend back in Washington, the color field painter, Thomas Downing. The atmosphere is psychologically far out, meta-surrealist in the sense that one's own consciousness is somehow outside of one's head. Super interest in art and evidence, but involving a curious frenzy, big picture Southern or something like that. In any case, it's right on and fulfills a need in me to get out of the New York City gambit and to think about art as a fundamental activity rather than a geopolitical hustle. He was surprised to find that Mark Lombardi, one of the students he taught in a museum management class at Syracuse University, had already arrived in Houston completely unannounced and had shown up at the museum to begin working completely uninvited. He was one of my most disruptive students, Herethus remembered, but what impressed me about Mark was he was just an incredible researcher. You would give him a project and he would come back with a book's worth of material. With Lombardi in tow, Herethus did much the same as he'd done in Syracuse. He spent most of his first two months getting to know the city and meeting with local artists. In Texas, he went much further, driving all over the state, knocking on doors and finding artists wherever he could. We just got in the truck and went town to town, said Herethus. It was just, hi folks, we're from Houston and we're putting on an art show, you know? And that's how we were able to find the people who ended up in the first exhibition. Uh, Herthus and Lombardi first went to Dallas where they rendezvoused with some of the city's best artists uh, at a reception held at the gallery of art consultant Murray Smither. Uh, the artist in Dallas who made the most immediate impression on Herthus was a sculptor named James Searles. With his ponytail, droopy mustache, and burly physique, Searles looked like some kind of East Texas lumberjack, which wasn't too far from the truth. He was born in 1943 and raised on a farm outside Malakoff, 70 miles southeast of Dallas. His father built the house they lived in, and as a boy, Searles' favorite toy was his daddy's roofing hatchet. He learned to use hand saws and hammers, rasps and cross-cut saws, and he and his older brother cleared their land by hand with axes. In early adulthood, Searles hitchhiked across the country and sold cars and life insurance. When he enrolled at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, he cons considered physical education, history, and anthropology as majors, but discarded them all and chose art as his major because it was the first in the course catalog's alphabetical listing. <laughs> he says he didn't know the first thing about art when he began making animal-themed expressionist paintings in 1964. He only knew that he loved doing it. Soon the lifelong maker was investing himself in sculpture, wielding the same kinds of axes and saws that had been in his hands ever since he was a kid. After receiving his bachelor's degree from Sam Houston, he continued his study at Michigan's famed Cranbrook Academy, where he learned the finer points of casting in aluminum, bronze, iron, and stainless steel, and became the foundry assistant in order to maximize his time with the overhead crane. Returning to Texas, he began teaching sculpture and design at Southern Methodist University in 1969, and turned his focus back to native timber as his favorite material. Traveling through the wilds of New Mexico during breaks from school, he absorbed the essence of its trees, rocks, rivers, and thunderclouds. There's nothing there to disalign your thoughts, he told critic Janet Kuttner when he got back to Dallas. It's the influence of New Mexico that made me think about whether a tree is a feminine tree or a male tree or both. I want my art to be alive like a tree is alive. 
About a year before Jim came to my studio for the first time, remember Searles, I had written in my sketchbook, in one year I will have a major show in a museum. In essence, I gave myself a challenge. I said to myself, if you're going to have a major show in a museum, you'd better get your ass to work. So I did. I went to work feverishly as though I had a show coming. He scoured the East Texas countryside for logs of pecan, oak, pine, and fir, of maple, walnut, elm, and cottonwood. He hauled them home and winched them with a chain hoist in his studio outbuilding, chopped away the bark and gave them shape, sometimes tying the ax to his hand to keep going even when his grip began to falter. Then he drilled dozens of three-inch holes and filled them with hand-cut wooden spikes, some of them blackened by fire, producing a series of rough-hewn sculptures that suggested the tribal imagery of the Southwest or perhaps the Pacific Northwest. Some of them were wrapped in coarse twine and rope. Others were tufted with hog hair. The tallest figure, high man coming to sea, was a column of spikes and jutting appendages that towered at 17 feet, inspired by the high-line pylons that gazed out over the deserts of Texas and New Mexico. When Jim Harethus came into my studio, said Searles, he looked around and looked around and didn't say anything for what seemed to be an eternity. Then he looked me in the eye and he said, you're ready. From Dallas, Harethus and Lombardi drove to El Paso where they caught up with Bob Daddy O. Wade, who'd been busy finishing up an installation piece of Oddball Texana at the university, the likes of which he'd begun, begun to become known for. The persnickety art critic Clement Greenberg once called Wade's work macho kitsch. In fact, he had been in Houston the previous year at the invitation of painter and art professor Earl Staley. With $3,500 from the National Endowment for the Arts to spend, Wade had used dump trucks to fill most of the St. Thomas Gallery space with different types of regional Texas soil. Next, he'd sculpted the pile into the shape of the state and decorated the mound with rocks and a stuffed javelina to the west, with mounted fish, nets, and shells by the coast, and hay bales to the north. Stuffed armadillos represented Austin, tortillas, the border towns, and a neon sign advertising Lone Star Beer represented San Antonio. Wade's 40-foot map of Texas could best be appreciated when viewed from the balcony above. Wade still had some money left over from the NEA grant, and he used it to buy material materials for his piece in El Paso, which incorporated rocks, bricks, cacti, dozens of velvet paintings, illuminated re religious icons, a pachuco gang symbol made from crushed taco, taco shells, and a skull surrounded by hypodermic needles. Herthus and Lombardi liked the work, but perhaps they enjoyed a hard night of drinking across the border in Juarez even more. Wade remembers a late night, late night blowout on the way back. He says he managed to maneuver the car safely to the side of the road and change the tire, all without putting down his jug of tequila. Herthus remembers the incident quite differently. I would not have left that man behind the wheel of my car, he insists. He was about as drunk as you could get. He did change the tire, though. Wade joined them on a trip to New Mexico to visit an old friend from his days in New York, a sculptor named Luis Jimenez, who'd become well known for his fiberglass sculptures that offered a biting critique of American culture. Now Jimenez was working in the desert town of Roswell with a stipend from art collector Donald Anderson. Herethus knew his earlier work but had never met the man before, and he was blown away by the way Jimenez was incorporating the culture of his native Southwest into the work. It would earn him a place at the top of Herethus' list. Next, Herethus, Lombardi, and Wade headed southeast to Amarillo and to Toad Hall, the fabled estate of the wealthy and eccentric art collector Stanley Marsh III. As soon as they arrived, Wade stumbled into Marsh's bedroom and fell asleep, leaving Herethus and Marsh to talk late into the night. Marsh had been hosting John Chamberlain, the acclaimed New York-based sculptor who worked with crumpled metal car parts for an extended residency during which he created 10 large works whose titles referenced the area's geography and culture. Collectively, they would become known as the Texas series, and Herethus seized the opportunity to make arrangements for a Houston showing. Uh, having returned to Houston, Herethus drove with his wife to Galveston to meet Michael Tracy, a true maverick of an artist who'd earned his MFA at the University of Texas and explored themes of sex, death, transcendence, sacrifice, and ritual with enormous gold-painted canvases that were so heavy and thickly impasto that they bordered on sculpture. After exhibitions at the McNay Art Institute in San Antonio and the Art Museum of South Texas and Corpus Christi in 1971 and 72, respectively, Tracy spent time roaming through Mexico and ultimately moved into a waterfront studio in the commercial port city of Galveston. Enraptured by his surroundings, Tracy began to plan for a piece that would explore the city's relationship to neighboring Mexico. Art historian Thomas McEvely, who'd come to know Tracy after moving to Texas to teach at the De Manil sponsored art department at Rice University, wrote that the point was to involve its situation on the banks of the Gulf. 
beneath the intense sacrificial skies on the hot beaches where in the summer the scent of blood from ancient Aztec rites can almost be whiffed in the air that puffs dreamily in from the south. In the spring, Tracy had wandered into the Imperial Sugar Warehouse where underneath a 60-foot peaked roof, conveyor belts unloaded arriving vessels and poured their sweet cargo into immense cones awaiting transport to refineries inland. It made Tracy think of a pilgrimage he'd made to Egypt and the Giza pyramids four years earlier, and he knew he had found what he'd been looking for. Tracy collected splinters from the neighboring wharves, each about a foot long, and had them cast in bronze, marked with the names of influential artists and important patrons. He also salvaged an abandoned fuel dispensing platform, and he brought it all back to his studio. When Herathus came to call at the end of June, Tracy had both a concept and the basic raw materials for his masterpiece. In front of a massive cone of sugar, he would spread out the largest canvas from the McNay show as an altar carpet. And atop the platform, he would use the bronze spikes to conduct a sacrificial evisceration of the best painting he'd ever made. Tracy took Herathus to the warehouse and explained everything. Herathus loved the idea, and he thought about the connections between Tracy's work and that of Herman Nietzsche, uh, whose art Herathus had already championed. A few weeks after the visit, Herathus received an ebullient follow-up letter from Tracy. On a large torn sheet of brown paper, he'd sketched a diagram of the installation with ambiguous crisscrossing lines. It meant a lot that you and Chris came down and your comments and encouragement were beautifully therapeutic, Tracy wrote. I'm still high and more quietly excited than ever. I visit the sugar almost every day and feel my waiting and looking are building a holocaust inside, the pressure to do it rising, ready to combust. I feel the time is ripe, if not perfect. Uh, the fact that Imperial Sugar was owned by the family of Sissy Kempner, one of the camp's newest board members, sealed the deal. Here's this guy with a full beard, Mexican rubber tire sandals, and a big straw purse, remembers Kempner of Tracy's visit to pitch the performance. But he made sense, and my husband Denny told him if he could talk the facility manager into doing it, it'd be fine. There's just one condition. There'd be no open flames allowed near the enormous mountains of pure car carbohydrate. The ceremony would take place there in September. It would be fully documented on video and still photography, and afterward, the pictures would be shown at the cam along with the carpet, altar, and sacrifice painting. By the end of August, everything was in place for Herathus's Texas debut. In a memo to board members dated August 28th, he declared his belief that the museum is greatly needed for the purpose of developing support for artists working and living in Texas, and that Houston could, as a result, become the major city for such activity. Having now looked at a large number of artists, I believe there's much undiscovered talent and that Texas artists can not only compete with major artists in other areas of the country, but also make an important contribution to American art. More than a few members of the local art community were skeptical that they might finally get their due. Herathus recalled that John Biggers told him, you'll never crack those people. But the board was willing to entertain the new director's notion, perhaps not so much for their Lone Star pride as for the realization that exhibitions by locals would be less expensive to produce. Herathus chose a dozen artists from those he'd visited or had met around town, some well-known, but most of them not, for inclusion in his first major show entitled 12 Texas, which opened on September 28th. The featured artists were Dorothy Hood, easily the artist with the highest profile among the group, Mel Cassis, John Fleming, Woody Gwynn, Rafael Martini, William Petty, Sandra Stevens, Michael Tracy, Luis Jimenez, Bob Wade, Mac Whitney, and James Searles. Only one artist of interest eluded him, Forrest Bess, Herathus was familiar with Bess's work long before arriving in Texas, but by the time he went to look for him on the coast, the painter fisherman's behavior had become so erratic that he'd been committed to the San Antonio State Mental Hospital, where he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and then transferred to a Veterans Administration hospital in Waco. Herathus wrote to him, even talked to him on the phone once or twice, but nothing ever materialized for the show. In the wake of the disaster of 10, one wonders if board members were queasy about the fuel platform altar, the mangled sanctuary carpet, and the series of documentary photographs overpainted with the artist's blood, hair, and semen that represented Michael Tracy's Sacrifice One, The Sugar. Other works might have posed similar problems for those with more traditional tastes. William Petty's Defining a Line in Space 500 Miles Long comprised a reference indicator in the middle of the gallery space that matched another placed exactly 500 miles away in Mescalero Sands, New Mexico, along with photographs of Petty's travels between the two points. Bob Wade installed a huge diorama on the floor of the upper gallery that decorated a giant representation of the state's emblematic Lone Star with blue bonnets, salt licks, stuffed armadillos and reptiles from his favorite taxidermy shop, and a pachuco cross made from Fritos and chili peppers. 
The whole thing was bordered with blinking blue Christmas lights to magnify the effect, but to critic Ann Holmes, it looked like some giant postcard in hooked up living color or some super classroom project to teach kids. Dallas artist John Fleming's Texas Lenny was a 30 minute road video, but due to technical difficulties, it often appeared to be nothing more than a television set whose picture tube pulse pulsated blankly in the center of the exhibition space. San Antonio-based Chicano artist Mel Casas provided two striking paintings from a series called Humanscapes. Apoc Apocalypse 2001 was an unnerving rendering of a vulture perched alongside three equine skeletons in a row of human skulls. His anatomy of a white dog juxtaposed bones and muscles with a snarling police dog. Placed beside it, Dorothy Hood's far subtler Earth Locus exhibited its own su suggestion of turmoil. With their vast patches of color and distinct organic forms, Hood's enormous abstract canvases seem to express dark subconscious longings. Since her return to Texas in the early 60s, Hood's canvases had only grown in size, and her dealer Meredith Long had found that he could sell the large paintings to upwardly mobile Houstonians with large walls. Hood's stock was definitely on the rise. Outside on the lawn, Matt Whitney's juggernaut was a massive construction of welded steel and transparent acrylic. At 37, Whitney was still a relative newcomer to Texas, having moved from his native canvas Kansas to the Oak Cliff neighborhood outside of Dallas four years earlier. While his previous efforts were small sculptures made from plastic and cast acrylic, the enormous welded steel sculptures he'd begun to focus on betrayed his background as an inventor of industrial equipment and a machinist in a boiler factory. He'd missed Herathus during his visit to Dallas, uh, but when he'd heard that the CAM's new director was wandering the state in search of Texan artists, he wasted no time and came directly to Houston to show Herathus pictures of his work. Ann Holmes was so taken with Juggernaut and its resonance with the shape of the building itself that she suggested in her review that it ought to be purchased and retained there permanently. In all, over 1,500 people attended the opening of 12 Texas, the largest crowd ever to have visited the museum in a single night. The writer of an article in the Rice student paper observed that guests wandered amazed and uncertain among the works, but that ultimately interest and enthusiasm for contemporary developments in Texas art overrode the initial bewilderment. Uh, Ann Holmes looked at the assortment of conceptual works and explicitly saw it as kind of a riff on Adler's controversial 10 exhibit from two years earlier, albeit one with an obvious Texan flair. I think we've done it, Lubeckin wrote a few days later in a letter to board member Faya Serafim. From all prelim preliminary signs, it appears that the Texas show is a tremendous success. I know the road ahead will not be easy, but I feel we have made a critical step in the rebuilding of this institution. Speaking to writer Charlotte Moser shortly after the opening, Herathus characterized the CAM as the poorest and most ambitious museum in the state. Then he showed his bravado by declaring, I'm not competing with what's happening throughout the country. The rest of the country is competing with me. <laughs> uh, so from there, after that exhibition, uh, in sequence, Jim staged uh, shows that were the first, in most cases, the first museum sh solo shows by uh, a, a, a whole list of names, Luis Jimenez, James Searles, John Alexander, uh, Forrest Prince, um, Dick Ray, Terry Allen, uh, Julian Schnabel, who at the time was a recent graduate of the University of Houston and came into the museum every day to beg Jim to give him a show, uh, and he, he finally relented. Uh, and uh, that all leads up to a, sh a show that uh, he staged in uh, May of 1976 by um, a video artist from Chile named Juan Downey, uh, who made this series of videos called uh, Video Transamericas, uh, which uh, was a, something of an ethnographic travelogue uh, that documented his travels to North America and into South America. Uh, it was presented with the support of the uh, National Endowment for the Arts uh, with 20 three-quarter inch videotapes screened on sets of paired monitors placed on pedestals in the CAM's upper gallery, all arranged on a floor map that set the videos and the, the proper geographic relationship to one another. Uh, but again, not everything went as planned. Uh, most of the tapes were played back not on monitors with uh, direct hookups, but rather on TV receivers with relays that lessen the clarity of the signal and introduced potential for fre frequent bugs and failures. Once everything was up and running, the exhibition was partially dismantled the day after the opening to make room for a performance by electronic musician David Tudor, and once reassembled, some of the equipment no longer worked, uh, and the staff had to close the museum for a few days to fix the situation. Mimi Crossley praised Transamerica as, as an exciting major work, but she was appalled that she visited four times to view, view the show, and not once was all of it working properly. 
Several of the incredibly beautiful tapes can only be poorly seen, thus poorly understood, she complained, then asked, should a museum undertake something it can't fulfill visually? Isn't anything worth doing, worth doing well? Doesn't an, an unsuccessful exhibition make it harder to raise money the next time? Because of the technical glitches, Downey's show was extended to run beyond its closing date of July 4th. Meanwhile, uh, Jim's curator, Paul Schimmel, uh, was busy planning to show a meticulously detailed 15-foot acrylic painting of Custer's Last Stand by artist and folk musician Eric Von Schmidt. Uh, Herthus had recently hired a willowy brown-haired hippie named Jenny Whitebird to be the museum's new curator of poetry and live performance, and in late May, she and Herthus visited with her astrologist mother to have their charts read. Distressed, Whitebird's mother warned them that something significant was about to take place on June 17th. I don't know what's going to happen, she told them, but it has to do with water. At a board meeting a few days later, Herthus announced that while the Custer painting had already arrived safely at the camp, he was putting everything else on hold. We're not making any plans until after the 17th on the advice of my astrologer. <laughs> on the afternoon of Tuesday, June 15th, between the hours of 3 and 10 p.m., a summer storm produced 10 and a half inches of rain. A medical center flooded, as did the first floor of the Astro World Hotel. Virtually no one was able to make it to the Astrodome for the Astros game against the Pittsburgh Pirates, and the opposing teams ate dinner together at folding tables set up in the middle of the field under the stadium's domed roof. At Methodist Hospital, respirators were being pumped by hand during an ensuing blackout. A man in swimming trunks was spotted surfing towards downtown on the 400 block of Alabama. He looked like he had a definite destination in mind, an eyewitness told a writer from the Post. He was moving in and out of traffic and making a lot better time than any of the cars. People all over the city were affected. Marilyn Lebetkin, in the midst of moving into a new house in River Oaks, noticed that as she un unpacked her boxes, her street was becoming a small river. And then her new front yard became a pond, but she had no idea what was happening over at the museum. At 4.15, employees at the cam noticed water seeping under the loading dock doors. A half an hour later, the water was three inches deep, and the five staff members present began to stack artwork and museum records on tables. Soon, the tables themselves were floating. When a pumper truck arrived after six, the water was already seven feet deep, and Herathis, John Alexander, and video curator James Sturgis had donned scuba gear to dive for art through a trap door in the floor of the upper gallery, risking their very lives as the electricity had not yet been shut off. It was almost three years to the day after a previous flooding incident, but this time it was far worse. By the rainfall's end, eight Houstonians had drowned in the deluge, and 630,000 gallons of rainwater and sewage overflow had poured down the rear delivery ramp of the can, through the loading docks, and into the museum's lower gallery, offices, and storage areas, destroying not only the building's wiring, air conditioning system, video equipment, offices, and bathrooms, but also the institution's library, bookstore, and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of artwork, including pieces by Max Ernst, Joseph Albers, John Miro, and Roy Lichtenstein that had been stored there by local art dealer Louise Ferrari. Two of James Searle's sculptures were floating in the floodwaters. Two massive mural paintings by Jack Mims depicting scenes from the state's history were ruined. Uh, the Ant Farm's refrigerator time capsule, which had never been suspended from the museum's ceiling as they had hoped, had instead been relegated to the back of the storage room and had sat submerged in the murky sludge for hours. Perhaps, Worst of all was the loss of some 200 paintings and 400 drawings by an abstract artist named Gil Quatricasas, who had shipped them to Houston in anticipation of a major retrospective. Herthus had organized Quatricasas' first show back in 1965 at the Corcoran, and in, in the spring, the Spanish artist had again sought him out in the hopes of reigniting his career after a period of isolation in Torino, Italy. Herthus contends that the paintings were simply beyond the taste of the moment and that his polite expression of tentative interest was misinterpreted as a solid offer and the museum was simply storing the work as a magnanimous gesture. Uh, in any case, the artist's life work was now destroyed. For all appearances, the camp was a disaster area filled with brackish water. It was still and dark, said Whitebird of the scene she found the next morning. The water was waist deep. We were all coughing from breathing the toxic sewer water and getting bruised from bumping into file cabinets and broken crates. At one point or other, everyone broke down and cried. Looking down at the ground, she found the CAA's original scrapbook from 1946, half buried in the mud. She picked up a framed paper collage given to the museum the previous year by Terry Allen. The work disintegrated, leaving her holding an empty frame. But incredibly, Whitebird's poetry files were spared, collected in a file box on top of a desk that floated peacefully on the surface of the water. 
Herethus's office was especially hard hit, but three items remained in place and intact. A set of spun glass keys given to him in Syracuse by Yoko Ono, a mirrored cross given to him by Forrest Prince, and a cow skull that to the Yankee Museum director was a treasured emblematic souvenir of his first days in Texas. In the hours and days that followed, rare books and irreplaceable documents were rushed to the freezers of nearby Jamail's and Butera's grocery stores to arrest their deterioration. Some papers were taken to labs at the Johnson Space Center in Clear Lake for treatment in a vacuum moisture extractor. Many of the museum's membership and exhibition records had already floated out into the surrounding streets and disappeared into the sewers. Dozens of artists, including James Searles, Jim Love, Dick Ray, Earl Staley, Richard Stout, and Lucas Johnson, showed up spontaneously to offer help and spent countless hours shoveling debris from the hot dank basement as the water subsided. Works of art were removed to the Rice University Stadium and across the street to the climate-controlled expanse of the, museum, uh, the MFAH's Brown Pavilion to dry out. Governor Dolph Briscoe visited with his wife Janie to tour the destruction, and he promised his support. Photographer Suzanne Paul, whose own exhibition had been destroyed when the lower gallery was inundated, snapped picture after picture of the devastation. Have you ever scuba dived in an art gallery? Herethus asked a reporter ruefully. That's what I did yesterday. Mike Hollis and Don Prince were watching TV in a motel room in California on their way to returning the artwork shown in a previous exhibition. They were amazed to glimpse Herethus posed waist deep in floodwaters in the museum's lower level being interviewed on the national news. In a stoned haze, they laughed out loud until it dawned on them what it meant for the museum and for their jobs. It was like the hand of God, remember Searles. It was like the plague, you know? What more can this museum endure? The combined losses would amount to more than a million dollars. A triage center was set up in office spaces loaned by the First International Bank and by the CAM's closest neighbor to the West, Robinson Gallery. The recently completed Pennzoil Place skyscraper allowed the use of their lobby for Schimmel's Herefell Custer show, which would open on June 25th. The Von Schmidt painting was the first thing rescued from the rising floodwaters. Uh, at a hastily arranged meeting of the board, Treasurer Richard Mayer grimly reported that the museum's insurance policy would not cover damage to the building from rising water and provided a maximum of only $500,000 in fine arts coverage. Preliminary applications for federal disaster relief were filed, but after two meetings with federal officials, the museum was ruled ineligible as an educational institution. Congresswoman Barbara Jordan intervened by writing to NEA Chairman Nancy Hanks to ask for additional funds. On June 22nd, a letter was sent to supporters soliciting donations. Help has come from surprising quarters, remarked Herethis and the board president, Baleen McCormick, in a jointly written statement. But there are many members of the community who have shown themselves to be completely non-compassionate and insensitive to the arts and the artists. We must then go to our members and our friends. It seems to come down to a small but devoted group every time. The prospects of raising enough money from this tight-knit group of Houston socialites seemed bleak. Unless we can rally the national and state art community behind us, Harith has told Texas Monthly in the days following the disaster, the CAM is destroyed. The flood had been an act of God, yes, but some board members and supporters perceived of it as only the next in a series of crises for what they saw as a badly mismanaged organization. How many times could they go back to the same group of people asking for cash for a program they couldn't even wholeheartedly support? It was a wake-up call, says Sissy Kempner. I mean, we really had to ask ourselves, are we going to let this place go down the tubes or not? On a billboard in front of the museum, the staff placed a sign advising visitors that the Contemporary Arts Museum has been destroyed by flood. Days later, an unknown hand amended the sign so that it read, the Contemporary Arts Museum has been destroyed by Jim. The CAMS board spent the fall of 1976 and the winter of 1977 chasing grant money and defending itself against a $600,000 lawsuit filed by Gil Quatricasas, who alleged the museum had been negligent in its storage of his work and accused the CAM of a botched attempt to dry it by draping the ruined canvases over seating at Rice University's sports stadium in the sunshine. Juan Downey also threatened to file suit. Uh, although the water level didn't rise into the upper gallery, the extreme humidity in the days following the flood ruined his videotapes and several maps and drawings. Uh, he complained that he received the materials back in the poorest imaginable condition and calculated the loss at over $11,000. The art dealer, Louise Ferrari, who had lost the most valuable work, simply wrote the affair off as bad luck, for which she felt she could hardly hold the cam responsible. Uh, within six months of the flood, several of the city's philanthropic foundations had already come through with support. Uh, the Owsley Foundation and the Oshman Foundation each contributed 25000 Brown Foundation and Makashan Charitable Trust each provided 15000 Five different funds and trusts gave between two and $5,000, and the Cullen Foundation topped them all with a $100,000 check. 
Museum's trustees gave an average of $4,200, which did represent a 900% increase over any previous commitment over the course of the museum's 29-year history. Over 1,000 individuals made gifts of $100 or less. Frank Galeska, one of the CAA's founders, pitched in a dollar. Despite this outpouring of support, the museum was still over $200,000 shy of making ends meet. We were going under, says Herathis, and it was pretty clear that the Contemporary Arts Museum was going to get swallowed up by the Museum of Fine Arts, which was the most boring museum in the world, I thought, <laughs> said Jim Herathis, not me. <laughs> Clearly, something had to be done, and the board cooperated with Herathis on a large-scale benefit event to be held in the spring before the building's reopening. Herathis embarked on an extensive letter-writing campaign, and he and Lebetkin made several trips to New York City to call in favors and secure work for a silent auction. The list of artists and galleries who contributed work was staggering. Willem de Kooning, Robert Rauschenberg, Roy Lichtenstein, John Chamberlain, Henry Moore, John Cage, Ed Ruscha, Nam June Pike, Takis, Luis Jimenez, Terry Allen, all donated work directly, as did locals. Richard Stout, Jack Boynton, Earl Staley, James Searles, John Alexander, Mel Chin, Forrest Prince, Hannah Stewart, and Dick Ray. Uh, there were antiques of all kinds, a spinning wheel and a post office desk, a Chippendale chair and a Queen Anne low boy, Patrons donated week-long stays at their vacation homes in Colorado, New Mexico, and Acapulco. Anthropologist Richard Leakey's Foundation for the Research of Man contributed casts of three two-and-a-half-million-year-old skulls. Maxime's in New York donated a five-course dinner with wine for ten in memory of John de Manil. Andy Warhol gave ten Campbell Soup can seriographs. Richard Mock agreed to paint the portrait of anyone who donated more than $1,100. I'm sorry to hear of the museum's attack by nature, he wrote in a letter to Herathis, no doubt the work of a fanatical Southern Baptist prayer meeting. <laughs> Even the ornery critic Clement Greenberg came through with a drawing. Good God, I don't think too much of them, he said of his own artwork, adding, it was distressing to hear about what happened to the museum last summer, as much as I don't like most of what it contained, which has nothing to do with the matter. The museum should be put back on its feet, and I have to help, too. On March 11th, the Upper Gallery ceremoniously hosted the auction sale for the purpose of raising funds for the benefit of the Contemporary Arts Museum's flood relief program. With hundreds of yards of silver mylar draped from the ceiling for the occasion by artist Gertrude Barnstone, the cam looked resplendent. Patrons, who each paid $75 to attend, and contributing artists ate fresh beluga caviar from plastic plates. Over the course of the night, some would find incredible bargains. A, a large Norman Bloom painting netted $6,000, the half dozen Warhol soup cans went for $2,400. At $12,000, a Rauschenberg collage was the event's most lucrative sale, and an anonymous matching bid uh, doubled the amount. Even if much of the work went for less than market value, it all added up. By the end of the evening, the cam had raised almost a quarter of a million dollars, putting its emergency fund drive over the top. The museum would survive, and since artists from coast to coast had rallied to the cause, Herathus decided that while he would not stop champion, championing Texas artists, he would construct as broad a schedule as possible for the coming year. In mid-April, the CAM tentatively reopened with a display of Mock's patron portraiture and a tribute to the recently passed and much-beloved Houston painter-gallerist Margaret Webb Dreyer. In May, a more formal grand opening featured small surveys of black and white canvases by Texan-born abstract expressionist Myron Stout and Trump Delay works by the Santa Fe based painter Paul Sarkeesian downstairs. And upstairs, the first American retrospective showcasing the work of a particular favorite of Herathus, the iconoclastic painter and sculptor Salvatore Scarpita. Born in New York in 1919, Scarpita's family moved to LA where his father created boss relief painter murals for public buildings while his mother pursued a career as an actress. Growing up, the house was full of creatives, but young Sal was just as drawn to the drivers and mechanics that populated the nearby Legion Ascot Speedway, a fascination that would stay with him for the rest of his life. Even as a child, he was interested in pushing limits. At the age of 10, he spent 34 days in a tree, and in doing so, set a world record for tree sitting. As a young man, Scarpita studied uh, art at the Royal Academy of Rome, opposed the fascist regime during World War II, weathering internments and evacuations. Uh, returning to the U.S. in 1958, Scarpita found representation of the Leo Castelli Gallery in New York alongside Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg, and his paintings had begun to take on the trappings of sculpture, with seat belts, straps, bandages, knives, and hooks piercing and binding the canvases, whose drab surfaces were often slathered with colored resins, splashed with bloody vermilion paint, or soaked in coffee or tea. By the time he came to Houston, Scarpita was pairing up large resin-stained canvases made from surplus surgical drapes with constructions inspired by Eskimo sleds, nine feet tall and 25 inches wide. 
uh, the show's most iconic piece was the American debut of Lynx, Scarpita's recreation of a small Italian tank from the 1940s, which had been cut into pieces, uh, and he'd happened upon it in a junkyard. Uh, despite the fact that the artist welded a metal plate over the gun's barrel opening, unambigu unambiguously transforming the war machine into a representation of peace, the Lynx was held up on its way to Houston by queasy U.S. customs agents at the border. Uh, the Lynx was strategically positioned so that its gun barrel pointed diagonally across the intersection of Bissonette and Montrose at the MFAH. <laughs> Scarpita swept into Houston's art community and immediately made an impact with his dramatic persona. He was larger than life, remembers the U of H art student Jim Hatchett. He was a big, robust man, and he was always as if he was in the middle of a scene acting. You just couldn't take your eyes off him. He would grab you by both shoulders when he talked to you, and he would get so excited about what he was telling you that spit would be flying. The exhibition was heralded as a triumph. In the pages of Texas Monthly, Michael Annis remarked that the recognition of two long neglected veteran campaigners like Stout and Scarpita adds a decisive cosmopolitan thrust to the exhibition schedule. Houston, which is already one of the nation's major art producing and consuming centers, needs more challenging presentations of this type to develop an artistic milieu that will shape rather than reflect standards of contemporary culture. Charlotte Moser put it even more simply in the Chronicle asking, could there be a more auspicious symbol for the future of an art museum than this show? And that's all I'm going to read. You've been extremely patient. I appreciate it.